the central aspect of the governor's policy is entirely self-destructive. I think there is a very good chance of the electoral arrangements we put in place this year surviving through 97. No, no way. That's a myth. Why have we got the business community thinking the pattern got it wrong? Quite simply, uh, businessmen are interested in their money. The result is 28 for the eyes, 29 for the nose. Yes! He handles the Chinese like the opposition party. He handles us as the opposition party. And I think whatever opposing to him, he will handle it that way. Mr. Hong Kong, yes. well done, everybody. No. Uh. colonial police training for a riot. With two years to go before the handover to China, Chris Patton was once more in conflict with Beijing, this time over his decision to tear up a battery of repressive laws that were at odds with Hong Kong's Bill of Rights that came into force in the wake of Tiananmen Square. The emergency powers have been on the statute book since the high days and holidays of colonial rule. They were last used during the 67 Cultural Revolution riots. It's inconceivable um, that a governor today, um, with a democratic parliament at Westminster looking over one's shoulder and international opinion, could ever use them equally. Um, um, I'm pretty convinced that they um, are in contravention of the Bill of Rights. So at some stage, um, I want to take those off the statute book. It would certainly be embarrassing if we left them around and they were used at some stage uh, in the future. Patton had little doubt about Beijing's response. I think the Chinese will um, uh, blow a gasket. They will say, you just want to create chaos. Um, what you want to do is to go around um, unloosening all the screws. Um, that's their present uh, line. From Hong Kong's perspective, the 1997 handover suddenly seemed very close, especially to men like Dick Lee, who was now a very senior police officer. I'm responsible for uh, formulating policy on major operational issues like illegal immigration, internal security, anti-terrorist, major disaster, major incidents. Only two years before, Dick Lee had been anxious about China's brutal approach to law and order. But now, in private, he worried more about Patton's decision to loosen the screws. Certainly there are people who want to take away our, our powers. And in some areas, perhaps they, they think we might uh, abuse the power given to us. Of course, we need to have a code of practice. We need, have, we need to have rules to govern how we use these powers. And I don't see any problem after 1997. As long as our force remains professional, uh, I don't see the problem at all. On the surface, the other side of the border seemed to mirror Hong Kong. Shenzhen, the colony's alter ego, was likewise all concrete and glass. But that was only the image. China's hostility to democracy and freedom seemed now to breathe down Hong Kong's neck. I think the mood is brittle. I think the community is hoping and keeping its fingers crossed and whistling in the dark sometimes, but hoping for the best. Not that the economy was in trouble. On the contrary, Britain's last significant colony was booming as usual, a mecca for investors from all over the world. But that was not the point. Every visitor would tell you, no, Hong Kong is a vibrant place. Things are going, you know, the economy growing, everything, everything. But working here, 
you can feel that a lot of your fellow workers are on the edge of breakdown. You know, sometimes you feel that on, the, on, on a bad day, all you have to, to do is to light a match and the whole house would blow up. There is this sort of tension. We are going berserk. There is no doubt about it. A little over the top, perhaps? Not according to Dr. Leung, a distinguished surgeon and one of the colony's most respected public figures. Inside, there's a tension, there's a fear. There is definitely a sense of pressure. Um, people look very cool at this point in time, and I don't think this is really uh, the, the genuine feeling inside. It, I think this is only the tip of the iceberg, that's all. Dr. Leung shared the unease he detected in others and was quite clear about its source. The fear of uncertainty, we still don't know what is going to happen at the end of the day. Because a lot of people now go into China. They can see things in China that they're, they're worried about. That worry found a symbolic focus in the new China news agency, Beijing's de facto embassy in Hong Kong. Demonstrators carry the coffin of human rights to China's doorstep. Free for the moment at least to make their point against Beijing, they protest at what is happening on the mainland. There, under the benign gaze of Chairman Mao, Tiananmen Square is peaceful. With two years to go before the handover, there's a clock that counts the days and the seconds until China regains Hong Kong. Beijing chose this moment to release a film, a crude piece of propaganda against a famous dissident. His offense, to campaign for democracy and against dictatorship. In 1995, he was yet again accused of subversion and yet again found guilty. His trial took one day. His sentence, 20 years. In Hong Kong, Margaret Ung joined in protest against a system where untold thousands of people live in fear of state repression. Her anxiety was that Hong Kong might go the same way. This is a depressing place. People don't want people like me. I'm not going to be able to find a job. Uh, what I'm doing, I, I'm doing mainly two things. L ma namely, I have a, a private pack practice at the bar and I write. No one is going to print my articles. No one is going to offer me any column. I increasingly feel that I really ought to go. There is nothing to stay for. The newspaper for which Margaret Ung writes had recently been bought by a good friend of Beijing. Critics claimed that the paper had trimmed accordingly. Press freedom is much more vulnerable now uh, because of the fact that so much of Hong Kong news has got to do with China. So you're going to have to send your reporters to China. They have to go there all the time. And if they go there, they're very much exposed to very physical and personal danger. In those circumstances, then the editorial staff have to think very, very hard about how they're going to, to use the news story. The prospect that Hong Kong's media would be stifled after the handover was by no means a source of dismay to everyone. Indeed, some tycoons appeared to relish the thought. I think there will be self-censoring, not uh, probably not that different uh, than, than Singapore. I've, I've never read uh, any Singapore newspaper criticizing their own government. I think some foreign journ journals have criticized them and uh, they were summarily told that your maximum circulation is 500 copies. So I think something like this in, in Hong Kong will probably happen. But that's not the end, end of the world. Doesn't worry you? Uh, no, because this is the transition. Actually, in China today, people are very free, provided. You don't criticize the Communist Party nor the government. By no means all the rich and powerful were indifferent to freedom or cowed by China. Jimmy Lai, for example, starring in his own advertisement for his own brand new paper, The Apple Daily, and well pleased with the result. Wow, 
Jimmy Lai is a self-made millionaire who smuggled himself into Hong Kong as a child in the bottom of a boat. It was, I felt it was hopeless in China. Even as a boy, you know, I was, I was, I was hustling in the street and trying to sell things and make, make, you know, make some money and all that. And I found it very difficult as a poor boy. And, uh, and I, I met people who came from Hong Kong and, and, and one day that a guy gave me, a, you know, a crack of chocolate and, and I tasted it. I said, what is this chocolate? Where is it from? Hong Kong. I said, Hong Kong must be heaven. Jimmy Lai was streetwise and worked hard. Soon he had capital, and then he saw his chance in the mass market, clothes that were cool but cheap. Jordan was opened in 1981 with $5 million, and now it's worth $4 billion, and we have over 300 shops in Asia. So it's a great growth. You know, every year we average 30% growth. Then he founded a weekly magazine called Next, hugely successful, always outspoken, and sometimes outrageous. I wore, I'm always a troublemaker. <laughs> I'm always. I mean, I love trouble. <laughs> I love the intensity of trouble. That's a great fun. In 1989, after Tiananmen Square, Jimmy Lai used Next to denounce the Chinese Premier, Li Peng. I was very mad, and I wrote a very nasty and rude open letter to him. And in the letter, I called him the the son of the turtle egg, you know, which is very rude. I don't, want to, I don't want to translate it. China exacted immediate retribution by ordering the closure of Jimmy Lai's Giordano store in the center of Beijing. In Hong Kong, it was even worse. I got bombs thrown into my house. I got people came here, ransacked my computer. And I, I got people fractured me. I got this and that, but I'm safe. I'm happy. <laughs> to save the company, if not his skin, Jimmy Lai resigned from the board of Giordano. But two years before the handover, he was on the offensive again, this time with the Apple Daily. Crime, gossip and scandal, plus a crusade for freedom and democracy. Hong Kong is our home. Hong Kong is where we want to protect the freedom. I don't give a shit what, what happened in China. This is my home. As he prepared for the launch of his new paper, Jimmy Lai had one simple message for his readers about Hong Kong's future under Chinese rule. Just don't have fear. The Chinese University in Hong Kong, a report on college life in America by the girl who had led the school trip to China. Since I'm the first one uh, from Hong Kong, so they pay much more attention to me. <laughs> they always ask me questions. Oh, that's like the game that I play in Montreal, this one. Norris Lam was now at university. I learned how to express my feeling more openly and how to think. Sometimes we didn't have time or, or we didn't know how to think in Hong Kong. We just tried to memorize all the things on the book. What I believe is that we need to think independently, not just like, follow people's thinking. Ever high-flying, Norris Lam kept in hourly touch with the Hang Seng Index. Oh, the Hang Seng Index, have you seen? It has been raised for 258 points. Yeah, it's like the first time I saw snow. You know? She was a carefree student, except when she thought about China. If they really destroy our own system, Hong Kong is not anymore like you know, our beautiful or lovely Hong Kong anymore. And then uh, the way of living maybe totally change, and I might just go away if it's not my home again. The governor was endlessly out and about. His message to Hong Kong, trust yourselves, trust me. His means, meet the people walkabouts. What we've been doing for the last uh, seven or eight months is doing them without telling anybody as well, which, <laughs> which has a fairly dramatic effect. Patton's surprise visits did not endear him to local officials, especially when he descended on the poorer parts of the city where Hong Kong's elite seldom chose to venture. We started by going to three temporary housing areas, and we discovered that in one of them, um, 
the water to the lavatory. It hadn't worked for months. You know, it's a small thing. Um, well, it's not a small. It's not a small thing if you're having to um, go to the loo in a public block and there's no water. Patton's district visits were calculated to remind Hong Kong and Beijing that democracy was not dangerous. I won't go in by back doors. I won't skulk around in order to avoid crowds or demonstrations. You know, we've got to keep order and stop um, innocent people who aren't protesting getting knocked over or hurt. But we've got to give people a chance to have a rant. <laughs> I think the, the process of them feeling that they can put their case directly to the, to the person at the top um, is quite an important safety valve. To over 200 police officers forced the residents go to the street and now they have become but, homeless. But most of them, most of the residents have accepted rehousing. You try to shut off dissent and you fetch up with more explosive situations and you fetch up with people being hit over the head. The Patton walkabouts also served to burnish his image as the governor who cared. How are you? How are you? How are you? How are you? <laughs> now, tell me, tell me how long you've been living here. You've been living here for 31 years. 31 years. Where are you from? Where are you from? Oh, thank you. Can I have one? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Two kids will be counted as one adult, so this one they can house about seven. Or seven? Yeah, in this room. Although it attracted little attention outside the colony, Patton used Hong Kong's wealth to increase public spending. Not dramatically, but enough to consolidate a degree of public support that any Western leader might envy. Bye. And everybody I visit, about twice a year, we invite them all back to Government House so that they can uh, see my house. That must be very encouraging. Well, I know it sounds a bit awful, but... It does. Um, no, I mean, it just... It no, just I mean, they, they come and have a cup of tea and have their photograph taken and look at the garden and... At the same time, in another part of town, a very different visit was underway. Lu Ping, Patton's opposite number in China, was once again back in Hong Kong and once again pointedly refusing to meet the governor. His contact with public opinion was strictly confined to a gathering of the faithful. With the tycoons and their allies among the politicians, he could be confident that no one would raise uncomfortable questions about dissidents or human rights. Patton was unimpressed by the performance of the Chinese leader. It's pathetic. I mean, there's um, nowhere else, no other people in the world who would behave like it. I mean, they're so crazy. They don't actually have to do very much to have um, people responding enthusiastically. And they just throw away the opportunities. What's your message to overseas businesses who are worried about politics post-97? They don't have to worry at all. I don't see that. And the reason for that worries. Everything will remain the same after 1997. That's the purpose of this assembly. The governor was also contemptuous of those British officials who wanted him to be more understanding of Beijing's decision to snub him. Oh, well, you've got to make allowances for the fact that they're Chinese. I mean, people here are Chinese, but they're perfectly civil and courteous. To get under your skin. Oh, it's so childish. Another British envoy had just touched down in China to be greeted as a conquering hero. Michael Heseltine, the president of the Board of Trade, was here with a delegation of British industrialists eager to do business with the most populous nation on earth. Heseltine and his team at the DTI were irritated by the conflict with Beijing over Hong Kong. Although there was no tangible evidence, they feared it would undermine Britain's trading prospects with the vast but largely untapped market in China. I have, of course, heard of the remarkable changes that have taken place 
The contrast between Heseltine's warm words and Patton's disdain could hardly have been plainer. Although the governor admired Heseltine's flair, he was dubious about such a high-profile mission. I think it's um, increased the strength of some people's feelings that there is a cornucopia um, in China waiting to flow um, over our slippered feet. Um, if only we would recognize the importance of, uh, quote, restoring good relations with China, unquote. Um, billions of business waiting to be done, if only we show our sincerity in our dealings with uh, China over Hong Kong. Although Heseltine was entirely loyal, the Foreign Secretary was only too aware that the President of the Board of Trade was exceedingly frustrated. Michael Heseltine sees this immense market growing at a huge rate. He sees the Germans and the French powering in at huge delegations. He wants to do the same. He's extremely good at it. Um, and Hong Kong is, a, is, a, is an impediment to that process. It's, it's something he accepts, it has to be dealt with and so on. But it's impediment to what he sees as a huge opportunity. I think I'm correctly analysing his view. Although Heseltine did not deviate from Britain's official line, Patton suspected that he had some sympathy with a Whitehall school of diplomacy which the governor deplored. There are those who think that if you don't have any arguments with China, um, if you have lots of visits and meetings, um, if you sign polite communiques, um, it will sooner or, liver, or, or later deliver um, Chinese agreement um, on policies to which they've previously been inimical. Uh, I think that's complete drivel. There's a difference between real diplomacy and um, shaking hands and smiling. Patton's frustration with the Heseltine visit was fueled by another conflict with China, this time about the rule of law. For week after week, the two sides have been wrangling about the status and the powers of the Court of Final Appeal that was to replace the Privy Council as the final arbiter of the law on July the 1st, 1997. On this occasion, though, there was a compromise to the outrage of the Democrats. For quite a few months now, they appear to be standing firm on principle in trying to give us some democracy and trying to defend our rule of law, and suddenly... I, called, I find a whole bunch of them on their knees, kowtowing to China, accepting everything, and telling the whole world they're so happy now that there is an agreement. The deal with Beijing confirmed China's right to exclude all so-called acts of state, treason, secession, and subversion from the jurisdiction of the Court of Final Appeal. The power in these critical areas would thus lie not in Hong Kong, but in China. The Democrats feared that the Chinese would exploit their authority over acts of state to crush dissidents in Hong Kong, just as they did on the mainland. What is clear is one thing. Whatever may or may not be an act of state is not to be determined by our courts. It will be determined in Beijing. Patton claimed that Martin Lee had simply missed the point. Ever since the basic law was drafted, the context within which a court of final appeal was going to operate in relation to acts of state was clear. That isn't changed one bit by the agreement that we signed this summer. But Martin Lee was not about to back off. If he continues this line of appeasement, he can expect nothing but attack from me. It's nothing personal. Because I want my governor, I want the Hong Kong governor to be defending Hong Kong, not betraying Hong Kong. The frustration is to um, have the argument um, turned to um, issues on which one can't give reassurance. If Martin spends the next two years saying it is all going to be hopeless, Hong Kong is finished, it's a disaster, um, I can give my opinion on that, which is maybe sometimes matched against his, um, but I can't stop people in this community and elsewhere becoming either uh, excessively fatalist about Hong Kong or excessively pessimistic about Hong Kong. 
There was no doubt that Hong Kong cared greatly about human rights, but Patton worried about what would happen if or when the crunch came. Would the people and the government find the resolve to stand firm against any infringement of their autonomy promised them under the slogan, one country, two systems? It's worrying that a community which is not prepared, prepared to face the realities about its future is in serious trouble. And Hong Kong is simply not prepared to face up to the fact that the Communist Party is going to have a profound influence on Hong Kong's way of life. The Chinese Communist Party was a Marxist-Leninist party. It's lost its Marxism. All that's left is the Leninism. And that means control, order and control. And there is no way on this earth that they are going to allow a high degree of autonomy in Hong Kong. In the meantime, official duties, a charity gala. In attendance, the good and the great, most of whom shared the view that Patton's passion for democracy had fouled up Hong Kong's prospects. The glitter of Hong Kong life disguised a mood of uncertainty as the colony prepared for its first ever real election. What was the point in standing for an election denounced by China? It was not an academic question for the barrister Margaret Ong or for Christine Lowe, who had been appointed to the Legislative Council by Patton three years earlier. They discussed the dilemma with a friend, the journalist Jonathan Mursky. A year ago, the Chinese passed a resolution in the National People's Congress that uh, on the 1st of July, they would liquidate the entire political structure here including the legislature. I mean, that's really, really bad news. That's really, really big news. But the reaction from Hong Kong was really relatively mute. And I asked myself why. And I thought that if people kind of reacted to every piece of bad news they've ever had in the last 10 years or so, Hong Kong would have got absolutely bonkers by now. It surprises me that there are people like you and Margaret and lots of other people who do continue to speak up, considering what it is they're speaking up against. I mean, this is the last government in the world which shoots its own people down in the capital city. I mean, yes. we're not dealing with cream puffs here. Yes, but <laughs> John, John, <laughs> what we don't realize is that we're not being shot at yet. No, so as I go nearer to, I mean, I, I discount all praise of courage and outspoken. It is free. You can attack Lu Ping, you can attack Chris Patton, you can attack even the Queen in Hong Kong. And if you attack the Queen, most people in Hong Kong will think that it's slightly bad taste. You don't live in an atmosphere when your neighbours are getting uh, taken away in the middle of the night. So, I mean, when the situation comes, are we going to withstand the test? And I don't feel confident at all. Well, but this is precisely what we have to fight for. Uh, our own identity, and it becomes more urgent because we're going to become a part of China. I don't know whether I can ever stand up and say, I'm a citizen of the People's Republic of China. So maybe people like me will have to be phased out. I don't know. Maybe it's going to take us, I don't know, 10, 20 years to feel a part of the motherland. But that's part of the emotional um, challenge that we have to deal with. That's why that Chinese diplomat said to Christine, if you really feel this way about us, why don't you just leave? And my response to him, he said that to me three times, and on each occasion my response was, but Hong Kong is my home, you can't say that to me. Is that why you're going to stand for Letchko? Oh yes, absolutely, because it provides a very public platform, and that's the only way I can try and put forth some of these ideas. This is the time to get involved in politics. This is the time to have a go. Just what Margaret and I were talking yeah, about, a last stand in a way. Oh, yeah, what? 
For many of Hong Kong's leading figures, to campaign for votes was a novel experience, though one or two candidates were remarkably confident. For example, the surgeon C.H. Lung. There are only two reasons why I would not get my seat. One reason if I drop that now. The second reason is that if nobody comes to vote. <laughs> well, my campaign has uh, been uh, running very well. I'm getting to the people uh, and they understand me because I'm a, a national figure in, in Hong Kong. Aaron Lee, LegCo's longest serving politician, had never run for election before. I'm very confident I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win. And the people in Taipo are waiting for a long time for a kind of a heavyweight to represent them in LegCo. That, that, that could really, you know, speak to the government, that could really speak to the Chinese, and also talking to the British. And this was the man who had bitterly opposed the pattern reforms. I'm a believer in democracy. I want to participate uh, in democracy. And this is a very hard work, but I'm enjoying it. I think, uh, you know, to me, that I want to be elected, I want to have a mandate from the people. So I, I believe that direct election for me is the most important thing. And I would not choose any other route to get into LegCo. Margaret Ung delivers an election broadcast. She's been persuaded to run as the lawyer's candidate, despite many doubts. I ask myself, is there something for a person as an individual standing in that legislative council chamber uh, do which which would have some effect and i think yes there is because there might come a moment when something needs to be said and you may very well be one of the very few people going to say it you can show us, I think. Yes. she has two rivals both more established both more conservative while they are cautious about china she is combative i ask you to choose someone firstly with some credibility in the community, that this person must be someone you can rely on to stand on principle. Because if we are prepared to give in simply because the other side will not listen, then the whole point of our communication will be lost. So she is painfully aware that her decision to run could have dire consequences. The one thing about standing election is that you do stand a real risk of winning. And if you do win, then you are going to be in the Legislative Council chamber on the 30th of June 1997. So that is very daunting. Another of the candidates approached the contest in a style which his mentors in Beijing must have found hard to categorize. I really don't know how they think about me. They look at me as somebody who is just a really a strange animal but uh, uh, quite friendly to them and uh, quite patriotic. Certainly, from my prior uh, appointments within the Chinese government, Hong Kong advisor, PWC members, they consider me a good friend of China. Uh, although uh, my working style, uh, uh, my personal lifestyle uh, is vastly different from uh, a, a, a typical Chinese official. An astute entrepreneur who had fiercely opposed pattern in print, David Chu knew that his eccentric enthusiasms might count against him. Exactly. Uh, so I'm going to put all this lovely things, exciting things, behind me as of more or less today. What do you mean by that? Well, I'm going to concentrate on more serious work. But uh, all these exciting things prepare, prepares me well for what I'm about to face in the future. But you mean no more paragliding records? No more diving down rapids? Well, I, I don't want to make any firm promises at this time, but certainly uh, these activities will be reduced. Oh. I'm still going to drive my motorcycle to, to my LegCo meetings. But... And the Ferrari is not going to be put in mothballs? Or will it be? Well, it will be less used, for sure. The campaign pitted candidates against one another on television. Orderly affairs, for the most part, 
there were occasions when the political tension that generally lies beneath the surface in Hong Kong suddenly burst into the open. The cause of the conflict here, who was to blame for the riots in Hong Kong during the Cultural Revolution 30 years ago? The governor was optimistic about the election. I think that people in Hong Kong will always be more inclined to vote for people who they think stand up for Hong Kong um, rather than um, uh, uh, lick boots. Um, I think they will always be more inclined to vote for a bit more say in their own affairs rather than a bit less. But I think it's, it's less about a specific democratic manifesto than about um, whether or not they think people are prepared to stand up for them. And the fact that they react like that whenever they're challenged, whenever it comes to the crunch, is, I think, a reason for being more rather than less confident about the future. For this event to seal it up... In this election, most people had two votes, one for the 20 directly elected seats and one in the so-called functional constituencies representing various sectors of Hong Kong's workforce. It was a perplexingly complex and time-consuming procedure. But the difference here is that this ballot paper will not be invalid because um, the mistake that the elector has made um, is not material. You should advise the Vatican on this method. I think it would be, it would be very, very suitable for um, the next pope, wouldn't it? Would you be prepared to spend some time in Rome? <laughs> At least, though, every seat in LegCo would have to be won through the ballot box rather than by appointment from the governor. The momentum of democracy sucked in even Beijing's most loyal servants. Our objective is to convince the voters in Hong Kong that um, although we are called pro-China, we make use of our channels of communication with the Chinese government to work for the Hong Kong people. We are trying to prove that, that we, we are right by taking an active part in the elections and trying to show people, both in the pro-China camp and in, in the uh, society at large, that we can win support from the voters. Chung Yok Sing knew that his party lacked credibility, but that to boycott the election would have been even more damaging to Beijing's cause. In most of the constituencies, there is a close fight. Yeah, so we are working hard. There are those busybodies doing their polls, right? One day I'm leading, and then the other uh, few days later, I fall behind. So, uh, well, we have to work hard. Christine Lowe decided to run as an independent. I will always speak out for what I think is right, and a lot of people who um, said they would vote for me essentially say, well, we're backing you because you're willing to speak out for us and uh, you're willing to speak out for what you think is right. So that seems to be, you know, a very prime factor. The other thing is people say, well, you're young and energetic, you know, you've done some things in the last few years and we like that, so we want to support you, you know, we think you will take us forward. You feel young and energetic? You're pretty young and energetic, yeah. <laughs> Government advertisements stressed the importance of going out to vote, but there were those who rather hoped the electorate would stay at home. Democracy, even if we have full-fledged democracy, it's not going to be a war that can protect us from Beijing. So that's why all along I've always been saying that we've got to work with Beijing, we've got to try and find out what their concerns are and assure them that we're not planning any such thing in Hong Kong. And then we are hopefully left more alone and then we can get on with our business. In private, the tycoons admitted that it wasn't only China that bothered them, but the will of the people itself. If you look at the electorate, the merchants are a small minority of the society. And therefore, if you go on a one-man, one-vote situation, the so-called bottom of the pyramid, where people are looking at their own welfare, that uh, will dominate in terms of how government should be run, in terms of how taxation should be levied, 
and so forth. I mean, if you want Hong Kong to be a merchant city, then there are certain parameters you like to play. But if you don't want Hong Kong to be a merchant city, I think the one man, one vote situation would sounds very plausible to a Western eye. Most tycoons were more reticent than Peter Wu, though not when it came to enjoying the fruits of their commercial and financial enterprise. Uh, uh, a lot of famous people or major companies have their boats here, such as uh, this one belongs to Jardine Fleming, uh, Jardine Matheson, uh, the merchant bank. That's the this, Yes, uh, this one, uh, Peregrine, uh, one of the young, rising Chinese Hong Kong merchant bank. A uh, Gawa Bank, a Chinese-owned bank in Hong Kong, belongs to the city group. Uh, 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 this boat belongs to Larry Yong. Larry Yong. Uh, uh, this yacht, Crystal One, belongs to Robert Kwok, the owner of South China Morning Post. Uh, 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 this yacht belongs to uh, Li ka Wong well, King. So this is the best possible place to have a yacht where you've got yours and they've got theirs? I think so. I hope that this brings me luck. David Chu has taken to his yacht to track down a single vote. Uh, we're going to a small island called Ping Zhou, and uh, there's one possible voter who lives on this small island. And uh, he already committed his first priority to another person. And he's committed the second priority or preference to me. My job today is to reverse talking me into voting me first and the other chap second. This is not going to, going to be easy, but I will try anyway. Altogether, David Chu needed some 25 votes to secure one of the 10 LegCo seats elected by a committee of local councillors who had themselves been elected. Pretty bizarre, but it was at least democracy of a sort. Don't we look like a bunch of city slicks trying to con some villager? What do you think you are? <laughs> but actually, the villager may look simple, but he's 10 times smarter than a city slicks. Well, actually, my campaign is going much better than expected. And I think the, the result will be quite spectacular. Not an ordinary victory, a spectacular victory. By Sunday night, you will see me physically wipe all of these strong candidates off the map. Final moment, uh, he said to me quietly, uh, he will vote for me. The last instant, uh, uh, just before we wave goodbye. So you think you'll get his first vote? First most, preference. most definitely, most definitely. He's a very honest person, and he, he, he won't mislead people. At the Apple Daily, Jimmy Lai was celebrating success. His first edition had sold out. And it was the same day after day. By the time of the elections, the proprietor knew that he had an editorial and financial winner. His launch had been given an unexpected boost by his opponents. We got papers thrown in the harbor, and our Giordano shop in, in Bacal was on fire, was set on fire. And all that, I think, was either was because the distributor was somehow connected with Triad, or it may be some of the things that we wrote that offend the triad people, and they just want us to know that they, they don't like it. This baptism of fire was not without compensations. I, ne I never would have expected, you know. I mean, that, otherwise I would be very happy. <laughs> and I would, I, would, I would spend much less money on promotion, because, you know, I, we got great publicity just because a lot of people want to stop us. And if China were to put pressure on the Apple Daily, or to move against him directly... I would just lie down, lie low, and wait for the right time to come back again. I'm young. Would you stay here, or would you say, I'll go elsewhere and fight from outside? Unless my life is threatened, I would stay here. This is my home.
There were others for whom Hong Kong was home, but whose right to stay was in question. The home of Harry Harry Leela, one of the elders of the Indian community. A mansion shared by up to 60 members of his close but extended family, living in their own apartments, but communally. The Harry Leelas are very successful, but many of them were in trouble, denied a British passport, and likely in effect to be stateless after the handover, a predicament shared by some 5,000 members of what was known as the ethnic minority community. Well, I was a bit shocked because, you know, the Hela family is, is united. It's one family and the one roof. My uh, second daughter didn't get the passport. I got it, my wife got it, and they've denied my son Aron. Out of the six members, four gets it, two don't get it. It's surprising. It's just like, as I say, you, you're getting somebody out of the head and say, he will get it and he will not get it. The whole idea is that if you're giving to one family, you should give to the family. The Harry Leelas worried about persecution. If the time comes where we cannot stay due to some adverse conditions that China imposes on non-Chinese, we have to move out of Hong Kong. We have to go someplace, and we need that sort of a insurance or, or a security that we can go. I was very upset. I was more hurt than anything. Being born and bred in Hong Kong, a crown colony still, so to speak. It was, uh, I was in tears. You know, I think it's like a betrayal, really, to be honest with you. I mean, we still pledge, you know, to the royal family, to, to, to you know. I'm just, uh, you know, uh, surprised why this, this thing has happened to us. The issue of passports was now in the forefront of the governor's mind, not only for the ethnic minorities, but for more than three million of Her Majesty's subjects who had been denied British passports wrongly in Patton's view. I don't think that three million Hong Kong citizens are suddenly going to arrive at Heathrow. Nobody seriously supposes that. And to be blunt, if they did, they certainly wouldn't be living on the welfare state. The governor knew that he had no chance of winning that battle with the cabinet, and therefore he never tried. Instead, he set his sights on getting the Home Office to change the rules, to allow some three million citizens of Hong Kong the right to come to this country without a visa, giving them some security, and incidentally, the same rights that were already enjoyed by more than a billion people elsewhere in the world. The importance of maintaining our frontier controls. Patton knew that the Home Secretary would be bitterly opposed. I wasn't persuaded by the arguments. This was a very large group of people who had to have a visa to come to the United Kingdom before the 30th of June. So I was being asked to change the position. And I thought there was a strong argument for maintaining the position as it was. They weren't being disadvantaged in any way. They required a visa before the 30th of June. It was my view that they should still require a visa after the 30th of June. What we have to do is to persuade the Home Office in general and the Home, Office, Home Secretary in particular um, that while there his argument is intellectually um, logical, um, it's politically and I think morally wrong. But I don't think that's justified. Um, there was never, for example, any question of any assurance or guarantee that there would be a visa requirement at some point in the future. So I don't think the moral argument begins to stand up. It will um, be an issue which triggers, um, I think, um, a good deal of criticism of Britain, tinged with a certain view that we're behaving in a racist way. So I think it has all the makings of a really unpleasant stink, um, which would make it more difficult for us to depart um, in 1997 with some um, lasting respect um, uh, left behind in Hong Kong. It 
it's not easy to see how I can lose this argument without losing quite a lot of credibility. Election Day 1995, a big day for Hong Kong, a big day for Patton. I'd like there to be a general recognition that whatever the outcome, um, it was a fair cop, Gov. It was a fair election. Martin Lee said to me that what was essential was that we left behind a legislature in which more than 51% of the members were pro-democracy. And I said, you know, frightfully sorry, I mean, I can see why that's an attractive outcome for you, but that can't conceivably be my objective. <laughs> if people want to vote for democracy or against democracy, that's their own business. What I have to leave behind is a system uh, which uh, meets the promises that have been made to people in Hong Kong. The count started at midnight. The world's media was on hand to witness Hong Kong's first quasi-democratic election. People ask me if I'm nervous. And I said, if I'm not afraid of jumping out from an airplane, do you think I'd be nervous about things like this? But are you actually nervous? A little bit, to be honest. But I'm in a very strong position. It's just a matter of winning by a hot big margin. And I'm aiming, aiming for the largest margin possible. We know very shortly. Alan Lee was in. Likewise, Christine Lowe. The Democrats and their allies were clearly in front, but there was always China's most colorful ally, David Chu. <laughs> Christine Lowe was anxious for Margaret Ung. Legal functional constituency. Margaret Ng, 723. Donald Yap, 444. Li Yip, 159. The lawyer's candidate was in as well. I missed number one, probably by one vote. So what about that key elector on the island? He didn't come through. Beijing's most important political voice in Hong Kong lost to a Democrat, but he insisted that the outcome was fair. I think the strong showing of the Democratic Party uh, is by no means surprising. They have a large number of incumbent uh, legislators. They have some very strong candidates and very experienced in uh, election campaigns. So I think uh, the results are perhaps much expected by everybody, including uh, Chinese officials. Nonetheless, Beijing at once rejected the outcome to the dismay of their key ally. Uh, I, I, I would uh, certainly advise them not to say anything against these elections. I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't help in any way. It wouldn't help anybody at all. Uh, no, I don't, th I don't think it's a wise thing to do. Uh, Chang Yok Sing was not alone. I'm going to China this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to tell them that uh, in the next two years, they really have to consider, let Hong Kong people do as much as possible and uh, the Chinese government and their representative in Hong Kong should involve less in Hong Kong affairs. Let the Hong Kong people 
uh, uh, take the driver seat. When the full result was known, the decision of the Hong Kong people came as a surprise as well as a delight to the Democrats. Their vote is a vote of confidence in us, in all that we have been doing, in standing firm for Hong Kong against China's intervention. And I said to myself, I almost let my people down. Because a politician, of course, be always believes that he has the pulse of the public. And, well, it takes an honest politician to say I got it wrong. <laughs> I felt the wrong pulse. The following day, the governor was endlessly on the airwaves. It was a momentous day with the largest number of people ever voting in an election in Hong Kong and voting very decisively. What's quite interesting is that um, uh, when this happened um, 18 months after Tiananmen, uh, people seem to think it was um, uh, in some way uh, just a result of Tiananmen and, and that people would think differently the closer we got to 1997. Well, um, getting on for two-thirds of voting for the Democratic Party in the geographical constituencies. So uh, uh, four years down the road, two years closer to 1997, they feel exactly the same way. With his team in private, thoughts that Patton could not express in public. Quite an important point to make, you know, is, is um, here we are, um, two-thirds of the people who vote voting for pro-democracy candidates. If we'd simply, um, in 92 and onwards, said um, uh, stuff there, um, democratic aspirations, um, well, we're going to rig it all. Um, just think of the trouble that would have ensued all that bottled up decency. By pure accident, the man who uh, got me into politics in the first place, a nice American, has been staying this weekend. And he's been absolutely captivated by the whole business. And he went round polling stations yesterday on his own. And he said to me today, you know, what was wonderful was seeing all these people who are proud of their freedom, practising it. So it was a good moment. I, Christine Lowe, swear that I will uphold the law of Hong Kong and that I will conscientiously and truly serve the people of Hong Kong as a member of the Legislative Council. So help me God. I uphold the law of Hong Kong and that I will conscientiously and truly serve conscientiously and truly serve the people of Hong Kong as a member of the legislative council. So help me God.